Welcome back to another episode of Epic Earth. Epic Earth is a podcast for those curious about the STEM fields, and the awesome, quirky, and fun experiences, and research that is taking place right now. This is episode number 15, World on Fire. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride, as we take another journey, around this, Epic Earth. How are elements distributed in a planetary body? What are our hopes? What are our dreams? What do we want to accomplish? And how do we accomplish it? We can have all the science in the world, but if it's not translated, how is that helpful? Welcome to yet again another episode of Epic Earth. I'm Ashley Bosa, and with me I have my awesome co-host Brian Rosenblatt. Hey, let's go. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, we have a very special guest today. She is um, a master's in geoscience here at Boise State. Um, and her particular research is K through 12 wildfire education. So it's going to be a really hot topic for us today. Um, and she is an alum of BSU already because she got her BS in geology here. So um, she knows a lot about uh Boise State and the Boise area and a lot about wildfires in this area. So please welcome Danielle Marquette. Hi, Danielle. Hi, Ashley. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming on. We're so excited to talk to you. You have a very unique topic and uh, the work that you're doing is so important and so relevant these days because we have, you know, given our summers here in Boise, wildfires are Definitely on everyone's mind. And now, what What makes you, you? Uh, So to start us off, Danielle, can you tell us a little bit about who you are? What makes you, you? Yeah, so I am from Boise. Um, I grew up in Meridian. And I grew up uh, in what was then country, kind of out on acreage. Um, And I think, you know, I was always outside, out exploring and fishing and um, you know, in hindsight, I think I was definitely meant to be a scientist based on, you know, my, my upbringing. Um, I would keep like these little nature journals and I would always, you know, find these little animals to take care of. And looking back, um, I have these, these nature journals where I would like diagram my little ducklings, like little time stamped drawings of my ducklings, like cracking out of their eggs and stuff. Um, (laughs) and I was like picking leaves and I'd save them. And I mean, I was definitely like meant to be a scientist in hindsight. (laughs) Sounds Um, like a true geoscientist for sure. Yeah. yeah, And I, I loved digging things up. Um, like if you'd asked me at that point in time, what I wanted to be, it was an archeologist. Um, and then as I grew up, interests changed and um, I started to think more about like communications and writing and I thought I wanted to be a journalist. So when I graduated high school, I went to uh, Brooks Institute of Photography in Southern California to study visual journalism. And I was there for a year and I realized that like you really don't need a degree in photography to be a photographer. Um, But what I wanted to focus on more was the writing aspect of that. So I actually, I moved back here to BSU and, um, signed up as a communications major. And I did another year, uh, at that point in my life, I was, I was working like a full-time job and a part-time job. And, you know, as a 19 year old trying to balance a fun social life. <laughs> and I was really not a highly motivated student at that point in my life. So I did really poorly, um, that year at BSU before I finally uh, called it quits on school. And then it wasn't until my late 20s that I went back to school. Um, it had always kind of, you know, I wanted to go back and finish my degree. It became something that was important to me. And so CWI had opened up just down the road from us. And um, I had you know, three little kids at home. And so that first semester, I thought, I'll just take like one class. So I signed up for one class just to see what it was like, see if I could like balance it. And I really loved it. It was really nice to get away and like 
have an intelligent conversation twice a week. <laughs> um, and I really look forward to it. So then that next semester, I signed up for like free classes. Um, and that's what started my, my academic journey again. Um, and so I did my associates from CWI before I transferred to BSU to complete my undergrad. And I went really slowly because I had three kids and then I ended up having um, my youngest along the way as well. So, you know, juggling kids and everything with school, uh, it, it was a long process. I started when, and let's see, I think I started in 2012 and then I finished my undergrad in 2019 and then went right into grad school after that. Yeah. So that is what has brought me into grad school. That's awesome. And then starting in 2020 um, with, you know, COVID, my entire grad experience has been the time of COVID, which is yeah. <laughs> super weird. <laughs> it's a whole new thing to tackle rather than, you know, well, on top of your children as well. So I'm sure, um, I don't know if where you lived, you had to do homeschooling with all of your kids, but that must have been yeah. a challenge. Yeah. So like COVID is like that thing we all experienced together, but we all like had our own little experiences with it. And yeah, especially like for us with kids, those of us who are parents and having to homeschool our kids all of a sudden, that was, <laughs> that was quite challenging. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can imagine. Um, but you're also, um, a big runner. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. 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 So I started running after I had had kids. Um, and it's kind of been like this slow, you know, progressive journey, I guess, just like my academic journey <laughs> to where I am now. Um, but yeah, I've become, you know, quite competitive and yeah, um, you're awesome. Like coming in like second place at these like long endurance runs, <laughs> like I'm always like, you. oh my gosh, my mind is blown. You're awesome. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. It's, it's a big part of my life now. Yeah. What a, uh, it's probably a good way to sort of, um, vent out some of the frustrations with grad school and with just stress of life in general. And yeah, uh, it definitely is. I mean, I, I think I started running as kind of like to, to get my me time, you know, when you have small children who are like <laughs> needing you all the time, yeah. like I need a, a little bit of space. So it was kind of like that, that venting and I have my, my me time. And it's definitely helpful um, as a graduate student to have that way to, you know, to burn off some steam. And I do a lot of thinking on my runs as well, which is always helpful to have that like quiet space. Yeah. Have that, that time to think. That's awesome. Well, you're an inspiration. Um, hopefully one day I can run like you, but <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I guess I need to start running. to get to that. <laughs> Baby steps. Everything. It starts with baby steps. Yeah, completely. <laughs> um, Gotta so, start with the walk. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that would be a good idea. <laughs> um, so uh, you do K through 12 wildfire education. Um, so what got you interested in this particular field of study? Yeah, so that's a good question because, I mean, I come from, you know, a geoscience background, which, you know, as you know, geoscience is this huge, big, broad field. Um, and I, I had had, you know, several different research experiences as an undergrad. And I remember as I was, you know, thinking about applying for grad school, I was thinking, what would I want to study for two years? Like at the time I was thinking like, oh, two years is such a long time to study one thing. I really, really need to make sure I love it. Um, and now in hindsight, I'm like, well, two years flew by really quick. <laughs> yeah. um, and I had gone to an outreach event uh, as I as I often did as an undergrad. Um, I liked to do you know those education volunteer type things with the elementary schools, and I ended up having a conversation with my now advisor, and she was like, you know, if you really like doing this kind of stuff, I actually have a research project. I'm probably going to need a grad student for it, and I was just like, what? Like, <laughs> could do this? as a graduate project, like it had never occurred to me that that existed. Um, I was, I was just thinking, you know, more traditional geoscience. Mm -hmm. So 
Yeah. So I was really interested in actually climate change education. And then I got into wildfire um, education through that. Um, because I think when communicating and teaching about climate change, really the most effective way that we can do that um, is through like the real life impacts mm. that we see. And here in the Western US, of course, you know, how we see climate change manifest most is through wildfires. Mm. Um, I mean, we have like our wildfire season now and you know, it means here in the Treasure Valley, we get soft in the smoke. Um, so, you know, that's an impact that we can't ignore mm-hmm. when it's literally, you know, it's in the air that we breathe. Um, and so teaching through like local phenomena like that has been proven to be a really effective teaching method. Uh, so that's what got me into K-12 wildfire education specifically. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah, I was going to say, um, it's interesting how like a lot of people in geosciences, they get into here with an indirect route or just they, they end up here with it, their path to get into geoscience is always interesting to me. And I think it's interesting how you try to be a journalist, um, like you had all these other things going on and then you ended up into uh, geology and then into a master's degree doing K to 12 education in, in geoscience. So do you think like, do you think, Um, going through all that journalism stuff and and taking the time away, um, like really helped you prepare for, for what you're doing now. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think for me specifically, like going back to school in my late twenties, like that's what I needed to do um, to, you know, I was focused and I was determined at that point in my life. I think, you know, a lot of people in their late teens, they don't know, you know, a hundred percent what they want to do, or they don't have the motivation at that point to really, you know, pursue something as diligently as you need to, you know, for school. Um, and some people do, and that's great, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, having all these different experiences has really helped me, um, to be at the point where I am, um, and to have different research experiences as well. You know, like some people, like they know as an undergrad, like glaciers and it's like glaciers, glaciers, glaciers all the way through. And then they're, you know, that's what they're gonna do for the rest of their life. Yeah. Um, but I've kind of like collected these different skill sets from, you know, studying different things. So, I mean, I don't know how they all combine, but I, <laughs> I'm sure it's helpful <laughs> and it is a, uh, yeah, it has helped me in my position now with education and communicating climate change and working with children. Um, yeah. yeah. It seems like it's the sum of everything that you've been doing all combined into one. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important to highlight, I think we've highlighted it before, but like, you don't have to know what you want to do for the rest of your life straight out of the the gates, you know, at 18 years old, like, it's hard to know, like, Hey, like I'm going to be really happy working in like a, you know, communications job or something, you know, like I know personally that I've changed. I know, um, several people at BSU have changed their career paths and gone away for a bit and then come back to school. And yeah, so I think that's a really important aspect that you bring up to, to just finding what it is that you want to do. And no, I think the, the average college student changes their major something like six times or something. I mean, it's, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I must have just been lucky. Like I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just stuck with physics and it ended up working out for me. But yeah, I guess I'm not normal. I'm not the average. I can't imagine changing your major six times. That seems like a lot. Yeah, it'd be a lot of a lot of classes. (laughs) (laughs) At some point it's like, okay, I have all the classes for this program. I should just commit. (laughs) Yeah. Um, well, awesome. Well, it sounds like you really found what you're passionate about and it fits, um, the puzzle pieces together with your communication and, uh, just your interaction with, with kids. So, um, what is the best or most fun thing about what you do right now? Ooh, so working with kids is super fun. Um, 
actually like there's times I really still can't believe that I am doing this for my research. Um, so I kind of feel like I am the cool aunt that gets to over and like babysit and sugar up your kids and then like hand them back and walk away. Like I come in with a bunch of matches and I'm like, let's go burn stuff. And <laughs> the kids are all like super excited to see me. Um, I go into these classrooms four different times. So the first time I go in and like introduce myself and we do a lesson. And then the next time that I come into that same classroom, the kids like always erupt and they're just like, yay, she's back. <laughs> and I give them these pre and post assessments to test out how well these lessons work. And I find these little notes on their assessments, like you're the best fire teacher, oh. um, wildfire forever, please don't leave. And so like, they're <laughs> so enthusiastic about learning this. And that's so fun to see. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, children can be like, such an intrinsic reward for you when they just like <laughs> give you the best compliments. Yeah, it is. It's like, it's really re rewarding work. Um, and I feel like it's meaningful work. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Like, especially, I don't want to make this political, but given the current political um, climate here in Idaho, um, definitely what you're doing is, is so valuable and it's really important. Like, how confused as a child would you be to see this, this smoke every summer and not realize what is happening or why it's lasting longer every summer? Or why, you know, like why we have increased wildfires and not connecting that to our climate change into the impacts that climate change has on, on these types of phenomenon. So. Yeah. And making that connection is something that I have really tried to emphasize uh, with my work because I found um, pretty early on that in the existing wildfire curriculum that we have, there is a lack of curriculum that connects climate change with wildfires. Um, and that's just such an easy connection to make. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know why, why we have that gap still, but, um, you know, I've been trying to address that. And I actually have to say, I'm, I'm really hopeful for our youth and it's been, it's been exciting to see even in, some of the very like conservative areas that I've gone into, you know, thinking, you know, maybe they don't accept, you know, anthropogenic climate change here. Um, you know, when I start to talk about, you know, our changing climate, people will raise their hands and be like, because we burn fossil fuels and that puts CO2 into the atmosphere. I'm like, okay, awesome. Like these kids are getting it, you know, mm -hmm. even in these areas where I'm, you know, thinking maybe they might not. Yeah. That's great. I was going to ask that too. Do you ever experience any pushback on what I you're have to not? That's good. Yeah. And are these are these classrooms that are inviting you in to come do these talks? Are they classrooms that you um, reach out to and say, "Hey, we've got this lesson, and we would love to come"? Yeah, most of them are ones that I have just reached out to. Um, I just sent out emails to teachers um, with you know, a little spiel about my research and everybody's been super excited to, you know, have me come into their classes. So it's That's been awesome. fun to, to see all these different classrooms um, throughout, you know, Southwest Idaho. Yeah, that's great. And it's great that they're so receptive to that. And, you know, like, I, I just love that idea. I love that, like the work that you're doing is, is being, you know, sort of spread around and, and people are really excited about it and really want to learn. Yeah. Great. Um, okay. Well, I'm going to ask you um, a semi serious question. Serious question. Um, so the first serious question I'm going to ask you is how would you solve a scientific problem on Uranus? Uranus. Like if there was a wildfire on Uranus, how would you educate the local population about it? And how would you tackle that issue? Oh, okay. So... Uranus, do we have any water to extinguish this fire? I am not a super, <laughs> I'm not up on my astronomy knowledge here. <laughs> I think there's a lot of ice on Uranus. So okay. 
<laughs> well, we're going to, I guess, melt this ice. And so we can extinguish this fire. Nice. Yeah, I am. <laughs> no, no, I have not ever thought fire. about what a wildfire would do on Uranus. <laughs> what are we burning? Uh, that's a good. <laughs> that's a good question. If there's lots of ice, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> maybe there's lots of fossil fuels buried underneath the ice. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 And people just found a way to extract it. And all of a sudden they're just putting a bunch of CO2 and things are warming up on Uranus. And, um, I, ice is melting without us even like really doing anything other than burning these fossil fuels. <laughs> Trouble. Sea level rise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Major sea level rise. I think. <laughs> Um, yeah, that was a, <laughs> that was a hard question. You did awesome. Good job. Just melt the ice. <laughs> to extinguish the fire. Um, great. Okay. Well, we do this segment, um, Danielle on where we ask you to explain your research to three different groups of people. Um, and it's basically just a way for you to communicate your science to, um, different sectors. So I'm going to ask you, how would you explain what you do? Cause you do it to a fourth and fifth grade class. Fifth grader. Yes. So I do this all the time. <laughs> all right. So to fourth and fifth grade class, I would say, um, I want to know what works best to teach kids just like you about wildfire. So I give a really short quiz and it doesn't matter if students know the right answers. In fact, I expect them to not know many of the answers. And then I teach a lesson that always includes a really fun activity. And then I give the same exact quiz at the end of the lesson. And I measure how well that lesson worked at teaching the things that were most important. And this is super important for me to be able to give teachers the best lessons that I can so that they can teach about wildfires. Nice. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like trying to tell a fourth and fifth grade class what it is that you do when you do it all the time. So <laughs> um, the next group of people that you would have to explain your research to is maybe like a high schooler or an undergraduate student who understands wildfires, but maybe is just not fully aware of um, exactly what it is that you're trying to teach. How would you explain your research to them? Undergrad. Okay, I would say that I am working on testing the effectiveness of K-12 wildfire curriculum, as well as teachers' confidence and willingness to teach wildfire curriculum on their own. And I do this by administering pre- and post-lesson assessments for the students and pre- and post-unit surveys for the teachers. Awesome. Yeah, short sure and concise. <laughs> Um, and the last person is, um, I don't know if you've attended, uh, a lot of conferences, Danielle. Um, I'm sure you have. Um, I just attended my first GSA conference last month, actually. Oh, nice. Okay. Was that the one in Vegas? It was. Yeah. It was really fun. Awesome. Um, so how would you explain your research to a professional at a conference? Expert. So I am addressing climate change education through the connection to wildfire curriculum in the K-12 grade levels. I'm testing the effectiveness of existing modified and newly created curricula, which utilizes phenomena and place-based learning in order to provide teachers with tested and valid lessons. And these are measured using pre and post lesson assessments. Um, additionally, my work seeks to provide educators with the content knowledge and understanding to competently and confidently teach wildfire on their own. And this is measured using pre and post unit surveys. Nice. Yeah. It's so awesome. I love what you do. Like <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a lot of fun. It's, and it's so different from um, a lot of the other geoscience sort of, um, you know, graduate programs, I think. Um, so it's such a cool, like, uh, unique, I guess, project and super awesome that we have people like you out there doing this kind of stuff too, because really we need to educate our young. So <laughs> Danielle, have you, um, considered doing the three minute thesis? 
I have not. No, I've heard of that before, though. I think you should do it. I think you do really well in it. All right. I will look into that. Do you know when it is? Um, it's past. Um, it happens in the spring semester. So we missed the one for this um, year. OK. But Brian, Brian's a good uh, mentor for the three minute thesis. He got. Yeah, because um, you won it, right? Yeah, I got the audience uh, favorite one for that, for the Boise State and then the statewide one. But um, oh, yeah, awesome. Luke, Luke Telfer won my year and he did some um, forest fire stuff, too. But yeah, he connected it to the local stuff and just the way that you super clearly just uh, just spoke your science right there was I think it would work really well so so did you inhale helium for your three-minute thesis because I remember you did that during your proposal and that will always stick with me (laughs) yeah I wanted to but they won't let they won't let you use like any props at all or anything so (laughs) yeah you have to do it with just all you get is one slide and you just have to talk for three minutes so I I asked I tried but they wouldn't let me well that was memorable so thanks (laughs) They missed out. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Awesome. You should do it, Danielle. We're looking forward right. to your three minutes. Next spring. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Danielle, I'm going to ask you a few questions just about wildfires in general, um, just for our listeners. Um, so can you just um, describe what a wildfire is and how they generally get started? Um yeah, so I mean, I would describe wildfire as the uncontrollable burn through vegetation, um, and that can exist in you know any type of ecosystem. So we have you know rangeland fires, or we have you know fires in our forests, um, and they behave differently based on the type of vegetation. Mm. Don't forget the Uranus fires. Yes, and the Uranus fires, which <laughs> are still a mystery. Yeah, we don't know much about them. <laughs> um yeah great and um are a lot of these wildfires are they anthropogenic um like do they start through anthropogenic means or are they mostly started through lightning like storm yeah, that's a good question so here in the U.S. approximately 85 percent of all the wildfires started are from humans oh my gosh um and that number is I believe a little bit lower here in Idaho, we have slightly more you know, lightning caused fires, but yes, we are responsible for igniting most of these fires. Um, additionally, a 2016 paper by Abbas Tablu and Williams determined that roughly half of the acres burned every year now can be directly attributed to anthropogenic climate change. Wow. So we are definitely responsible for you know a, a huge number and a huge, um, amount of these fires that acres burned that's amazing those are some crazy stats there um really like hones in on on just how impactful we're being on our environment um i guess that leads me into my next question because you said that half of them are are induced by climate change um you always hear stories about uh you know certain administrations tell us that well it's the understory it's the overcrowded forest um you know we need to clean up the forest um because really the the dead stuff laying on the forest floor is really the main driver of these these large wildfires um do you have any thoughts on that Yeah. So I think that is like such a complicated question. And I think that that's also, you know, why it's, it's currently being researched so much. Um, Obviously, like, I don't think that we can manage our way out of these fires. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we can't rake forests and (laughs) eliminate our wildfire risk. It's just not feasible. Um, you know, several years ago, there was a big wildfire in Oregon and it jumped like a mile wide stretch of the Columbia River. I mean, you can't make fire breaks big enough to stop some of these fires, you know, when you have the winds really whipping these fire embers. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, one of uh, another student here is studying the effects of managed and unmanaged areas to determine um, past fire history. And I think the results of that are going to be really interesting as well. Um, But I'm not actually a fire researcher. I am 
more focused on the education side of things. Yeah. So I might not have the best answer for that. Yeah. I, yeah, it's a very complex issue, but, um, yeah, thanks for your insight. That's, I mean, it's all very valuable. I think, um, even through your education, you know, how we portray, you know, the, the realism of what's happening, you know, um, and, and not just blaming it on mother nature, but saying like, Hey, like we have a huge effect on, on the amount and the size of these wildfires as well. Yeah. And I think there's just, there's so many variables. I don't think you can like, you know, a hundred percent peg it to like one thing, like, here's how we fix this. Um, but obviously, you know, we are responsible for most of these fires and most of the acres burned. Yeah. Um, can wildfires be beneficial in any aspect? Absolutely. Yes. And so that's also a really important point. Um, yeah, we need fire, um, in our forests and it's part of the, you know, revegetation process. Um, yeah, fires are part of a healthy ecosystem. Yeah. We, we hear so much negative like stigmas against wildfires, but yeah, just that I wanted to ask that question because it is important to also note that, yeah, like wildfires are also a natural process and, and yeah, they are a regenerative process as well. So, yeah. And I think that's where we, you know, start to look at what the recurrence interval is, um, you know, historically versus what we are seeing now when we are causing so many more of these fires. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Super important work. Um, it'd be interesting to see what happens in the future, um, in terms of, of, uh, you know, administrative policies and, and such carbon emissions and, um, yeah, just the effect on, on these wildfires. Yeah. And I think also just learning to live with them more as mm -hmm. well. Um, because that's, you know, a, a sad reality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not looking forward to the summer smoke. That's for sure. <laughs> no, it's terrible. <laughs> yeah, you can't go outside, can't breathe. Like <laughs> it's, it, it is pretty terrible. Yeah. And I've been surprised too, how many people are really impacted by this. Um, I have throughout my work going into schools and interacting with all these students. Um, I've met numerous students who are like, yeah, my grandparents' cabin burned down or, you know, we had to evacuate this one time. And I mean, you know, wildfire smoke is terrible, but I mean, compared to some of the, some of the impacts that some of these people face. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's kind of sad to have, um, you know, laws and, and policies being made, um, across the country where they don't really see a lot of wildfires. <laughs> so I yeah. think they understand the full impacts of what these wildfires do. So yeah, it's, it's, um, hopefully it gets better. <laughs> yes, we can hope. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just moving along, Danielle, we do this uh, new segment where we ask you to choose a favorite song or poem that's relevant to your research. Um, and so is there a song that you feel like really relates to, to what you do? So really relates? No, but <laughs> <laughs> kind of relates, says fire in it. <laughs> um, fire on the mountain by Grateful Dead. Nice. Uh, it also references long distance running. So, oh yeah, it's right up your alley. <laughs> yeah. So fire, long distance running. I will, I will go with that song. Nice. Um, do you know any of the lyrics that you can just tell us? I'm not singing. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, you can just talk it out. We don't. <laughs> so it says fire, fire on the mountain over and over. Hmm. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, you guys don't know that song? I, I'm sure I've heard it like a billion times, but yeah. Okay. Well, we've got to figure out a way to like add that in here. Okay. Oh, I will. That's awesome. That, that sounds awesome. Um, you know what else would have been a good song? Um, what? Billy Joel, We Didn't Start the Fire. Oh, yes. <laughs> we'll add a link to that song. <laughs> I have to go uh, Google fire songs. <laughs> yeah. Um, great, Danielle. Well, um, I'm gonna finish up with one last serious question. 
to end this really awesome interview. Serious question. Um, so what is your spirit animal? Ooh, okay. I think, uh, I'm going to have to go with like a mountain goat. Nice. <laughs> Cause I like to run through the mountains. So <laughs> Yeah, they're really agile. They're very good at sticking close to the cliffs and yeah. they're beautiful. So or maybe an antelope because they, they like to run too. Mm. They do. Antelope run really quickly there. <laughs> um, yeah, that's awesome. I could see that for sure. Um, well, Danielle, this has been such a fun interview. Uh, again, I just want to emphasize the work that you're doing is so amazing and, um, really valuable. And we need more people like you to get into those classrooms and really excite those students about, you know, about STEM fields and about the research that we do and, um, yeah, burning a lot of matches. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming on and yeah, thank uh, you for having me. Yeah. And we, we hope to hear some amazing things from your research. So keep us updated. Will do. Do you have anyone that you want to shout out before we uh, sign off? Oh yes. My amazing advisor, Dr. Jen Pierce. Thank you for letting me take on such an awesome project that I just enjoy so much. Sweet. Great. Danielle, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that was an epic conversation. We'd like to thank all of our listeners. Tune in next time for another Epic Earth podcast. Do you want all like 37 years worth of <laughs> background? <laughs> sure. No, you can just give us I'll, give you, I'll give you the short version. Yeah. <laughs>